Welcome to Car Therapy, a podcast striving to connect people with genuine discussion and gain perspective about people's trauma. For the sake of privacy, every name on this podcast is a pseudonym. This podcast is not directed to treat mental illness. Then, so yeah, I was teaching in a different city in Yuma. He lived in Phoenix. He was. The reason they found the melanoma is he was donating a kidney to a family friend. Fuck. Yeah. 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 He was was, was like, and I got. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was an ugly family. (laughs) Yeah, he was a nice person. Um, So apparently there's like a really strenuous screening process. They found the melanoma. They went to take it out, and apparently, if like they go to remove <clears throat> melanoma and it, or I guess cancers in general, and they don't get it all, it's just like spraying fire on an ant hill, so the cancer just spread through his entire body. Um, so when we found out it was stage four, and he was gonna have to go through like extreme treatment. Uh, he was like a waiter and a bartender at the time. So he didn't have great coverage just before Medicaid, Medicare kicked in. So yeah, back in 2014, um, he ended up fortunately getting treatment at the University of Arizona's um, oncology ward for free. And it was, I think that now it's pretty common, but at the time it was like pretty breakthrough. It's called IL-2. It's like a biotherapy. And she went through. And it was like terrible treatment. Uh, like, it would be like uh, 40 or 72 hours of treatment where they just ramp up his immune system and he'd gain like 80 pounds of water weight. <laughs> yeah, it was just like somebody had tossed a beehive at him. You'd just swell up. But it worked. Then, like, a long care Medicaid, Medicare kicked in, and he got accepted to MD Anderson. And funny enough, like, his first trip to MD Anderson, they scanned him, and he was completely clear. And so, like, that treatment that he got, that was, like, some revolutionary type of treatment. That was because, you know, normally, like, what I hear about is people get chemotherapy. And- yeah, so we, I mean, he was getting the works. He was getting IL-2. I think I have that right. IL-2, which is the biotherapy, chemo, and radiation. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and he was just like getting the works. It really fucked him up. Uh, it's funny, I moved in with him and I was a teacher at the time. And uh, it was really cool. We were really close before, so I got to like live with him. And since he was just like at home sick all the time, he would just cook these like amazing meals every night, like every night. And uh, and come home with like dumb bullshit work complaints, totally forgetting that he had just like had a round of chemotherapy and he'd like listen to it and just be like, oh man, yeah, that sounds like it sucks. <laughs> I was like, oh fuck. Okay. Okay. I totally forgot you have stage four cancer and my problems are pretty trivial, but yeah, I liked listening to him. Well, tolerated listening to him. How old was he, like, at the time where he has cancer and stuff Um, I just became old. I just became as old as he was when he died. He was 35. Sick when he died? Uh, shit. He was 34 or turning 35 or 35 or turning 36, but it was, uh... Four days before his birthday. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So 2014, the night of May 6th, the morning of May 7th, my brother was murdered while walking three blocks home from the bar that he worked at. And he was shot in the neck. And they never found out who did it. Or why. Or why. 
all of his uh, belongings were on him. Somebody called it in, just thinking that a vagrant had died in the neighborhood. I woke up that morning. I was living with him at the time. Uh, he wasn't home, which was abnormal. Thought it was strange, so I called him and texted him. Uh, uh, thought something was up, like maybe he had witnessed something going on. We lived in like, not a terrible neighborhood, but a questionable one. So I thought that just while I left for work, I was going to drive down a couple of the blocks. And when I turned out of the neighborhood, the street was taped off and there was a blanket over a body and I noticed his shoes and hat sticking out under it. So I got out of the car. I told the patrol officer that it was my brother. And then we just waited there all afternoon while the whole crime scene situation happened. Um, they didn't know he had been killed. At first, I kept on like fighting the urge to say he had been killed. Like I had to call out of work because I was on my way to work. That was a weird thing to think about. Um, and then three hours later when they turned the body, they found the bullet wound in his neck. And yeah, it was classified as a murder. Okay, so he was found dead. Like, so you're pulling out of the driveway, and it's not mm -hmm. on the corner of your block, or? Yeah, we lived in like a, it was like a quasi cul-de-sac. So, yeah, pulled out of the driveway, and down the street, turned left. And it was weird, just like everything that kept on happening just made sense. Like, I saw the police tape, I was like, yeah, I kind of expected something was off. Um, and I mean, it was so fast, but the sequence was I saw the police tape and then I saw the body and I knew it was his. So he was almost home, like, yeah. really like yeah. that way. No, it was like, yeah, it was really shitty. So at first, like, even the cop was just like, well, we don't see any like foul play happening right now for any evidence of like trauma. He had, the reason I was living with him is he had just like gone through chemotherapy for stage four cancer. So I moved in with him, um, like, two or three months before he was murdered, he was cleared for full recovery. And I don't know. Yeah, in my mind, I just like kept on thinking how terrible it was if like somehow the treatment had just been too much on his body and he had been have, having a heart attack and like trying to get home for help. Um, so you were thinking that was also that person? <sighs> Yeah, only, I don't know. No, at first I was thinking, like, something terrible, like he had been killed, like he had been murdered, but for the first three hours, the cops were saying that it didn't seem to be that way because they hadn't turned the body because they were waiting for all the investigation units to come by. Um, it was a little bit odd that the paramedics didn't, but whatever. Oh, um, yeah. Can you talk about your guys' relationship like before you moved in with him? Yeah. Yeah, he was an older brother. The only other like boy in the family. I have two sisters. We're all one year apart, but he was six years older than me. So there was like a, I don't know, just like big brother complex. I was just like obsessed with him, so. Yeah, I totally know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, even when I, so we're from Arizona when I moved to New York for school, like, like, I don't know, I'd try to convince him to move out there. So the weird thing was like moving in with him when he got cancer was like a dream. It's like, yeah, man, we're going to hang out, pal around. Uh, yeah, I don't know. We were just really close. We were different, but 
I'm from the same cloth, which I didn't really get from my uh, my sisters. Even the night slash morning that he was killed, you know, we were going to the bar that he worked at down the way. Just for like a trivia night, we would just like hang out, play pool, sit on the back porch, drink beer, cook together. So you guys were always close and then fucking moving in was just like the biggest news to you, but you knew, like at this time you're convinced he's gonna die from, say, for cancer, right? Yeah, yeah, like, uh, we laughed. I called out of work the day he went to get his screening when they cleared him. We were kind of expecting the worst, which is why I wanted to be with him. Like, we said it already, like, spread to his neck, and, uh, I forget, like, bones in his body, like, it, it had just spread a lot, and, I don't know, I was just laughing with him, it's like, no, I'm excited to take a day off work, and nobody can, nobody can say shit, you got cancer, man, like, we just use it as an excuse for everything, uh, yeah, we just, and then, no, oh yeah, no, and then we were just um, there, and it was funny, we were in the elevator, and he had his screening, after he had his screening, we were in the fucking elevator at MD Anderson with this, like, bald lady, it's like, there, on that doorstep, just, like, trying not to celebrate, <laughs> she was, like, there in the throes of her life, and, like, we were having the best news we had ever had. Like, not believing it. It was just, like, winning the lottery. Yeah. Do you think, like, did you talk about how he felt about knowing he was gonna die? Like, stuff like that? Because, like, I'm assuming you get diagnosed with stage 4 cancer. You're like, alright, this is fucking it for me. Yeah, and, like, we didn't avoid it. We would talk about it. Not on a surface level, but more about just, like, how he was feeling. Like, stuff his body was going through. Um, a couple of times... He had a fiance who we, who he obviously lived with, and you know, just a couple times at night, if conversations had taken a turn to the more serious, you know, he would just ask if things went poorly, like if I would, you know, make sure she was all right, and you know, he basic signing off stuff like you know letting me know that he loved me you know we all close and touchy feely about it from time to time and so he he had a fiance too that he was so when you moved in you were also living with him and his fiance yeah they had been together for like eight years uh yeah she was yeah, they had been together. Because that's what I was thinking when um, you told me he worked at a bar and like he had to come home. I was like, why didn't you assume he was with a girl? But that makes sense that like, he's fucking... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, and like I even had those thoughts. I was like, I mean, my last text to him was just like, hey man, she was back in Kansas City because her grandfather had passed away. Mm -hmm. And so we didn't go out. It was really nice. So uh, whenever she'd go out of town, she hated like shrimp and red meat. So we would do a shrimp and steak dinner. So the night before we had like this really nice meal of the two of us. But then, yeah, there was that thought in my head when I woke up and he was gone. I was just like, oh shit, like Kevin. <laughs> Kevin done gone and got some strange, which also wasn't like him, but stuff happens. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, my last text message to him was just like, hey, if you did something stupid, just let me know so I don't worry. I'm gonna like hop in the shower and go to work. I'll check in with you later. Yeah. Do you feel like in a way you were prepared for him to die? Because like, like mm -hmm. mentally? No, I, I, I was prepared for him to die, but in, I don't know, seeing like how he got sick when he went through treatment and knowing what stage four cancer was. You know, we got involved in the cancer community, like different cancer walks and fundraisers. Um, but I thought it would be like seeing him waste away, which I also wonder like if this was better, but there was like a whole 
whole different trauma to like just murder and getting snuffed out. That I, I don't know, like I never even considered. Like there's nothing. Well, I feel like there's no real way to prepare for that either. Like, you know, especially after he's been through cancer, right? He gets cleared for a couple months, right? You think he's gonna fucking live, right? Yeah, he's gonna live or, you know, we've even talked about relapses. Relapses, is that what they call it or is that just drugs? <laughs> I'll go with it, I know what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> I have the wrong cancer terminology, but... Resurgence. <laughs> um... You know, I just, I thought that's what it would be. You know, we're like, poor white family, but not involved in anything that had us used to, like, violence. You know, random acts of violence, like murder, were just... It, it was so bizarre to experience. Like, really bizarre. So bizarre, it was fun that, like, he was the one that I wanted to like talk to about how mind blowing this fucking situation was. Well, from my perspective, like hearing the story, it's literally like that's not fucking possible, right? You know, you're funny as fuck, and so I'm imagining this guy being like super funny, and also converted, you know, and like the fact that he was like trying to donate a fucking kidney, right, then gets diagnosed with cancer. Yeah, like he was just an absolute fucking asshole. Like, I, I mean. Well, no, I feel like, I feel like you're, you and your family sound like an asshole the way my family is, where it's like, like, my brother's a fucking dick, but he's so funny. He's so funny while he's being an asshole, like, you can't help but laugh with him, you know? Yeah, well, and that was the thing, like, there was no... With him, there was no, uh, pleasantries or politeness, but, like, the, the kindness was more just an action, so... They never caught the murderer, but like a month before he was killed, there was a uh, homeless guy that moved into the alley behind our house. And I was like taking out the garbage one night and it just scared the shit out of me. I like opened the gate and there was this dude and just like, hey, you know, do you mind if I, I stay out here? So, like, no, you know, just take, take care of your shit and and my brother would like, when he cooked us meals, he'd like bring him out meals. If he could pick up an overtime shift, but the neighbor needed, we had this neighbor that was like elderly and they needed like a rail bar installed in their bathroom. Like you just go and do that. Like, yeah, he obviously wasn't doing great because I moved in with him to help him with rent for cancer, but so like groceries were really an issue and he would just like take out groceries to the homeless guy behind the behind the house the guy also started throwing his garbage over fences and like that action versus politeness like he'd go out and just be like dude you you can't do that and stay here like neighbors will complain like you're not my ward but like don't you know told the guy not to be a dick and we'd see him in the neighborhood and, you know, one time he was just like, yeah, you know, I want everyone to like me and Kevin could care less. So he's like, yeah, you're cool. But that guy with the beard, which was my brother, like he's a real fucking asshole. And I was like, no, he's just kind of telling you how it is. But, you know, I'll talk to him, but you really need to like not throw your feces over fences. And so, uh, like this homeless guy was, he like, because I'm thinking about the homeless people I know, and it's like, you can't even have, like, a lot of conversation. Well, some of them might be the mental illness or drugs or something, but this guy was, like, coherent and stuff, or no? Yeah, he was, like, coherent enough. There was one night that we were having dinner out on the back porch, and, you know, he had a partner in his, like, campsite. And what stood out to me and what I talked about with the detectives was, um, she started screaming, you're the big man, you're the big man with a gun. Like, if you have a gun, like, do something about it. And we just laughed and we're like, ah, oh, what are you gonna do? North Phoenix. Like, that's how it goes. Um, but during that morning, and then once I realized he was murdered and we were talk I was talking to detectives about like, hey, does anything stand out as abnormal? You know, there was one guy at the bar that night that was a little a bit belligerent. Um, and then this homeless guy, 
and that didn't like him. And so I mentioned him and we went out and we checked his campsite and he was gone. And just like, there's all sorts of like weird violent shit, like scribbled in Sharpie all over his like bedroll and on the wall next to him. And I got, there's no talent, but just that made the most sense in my mind. Like, they did find him. They arrested him on he had a record. They arrested him on a weapons charge that was apparently unrelated. He did three years. Um, but there was no tying to, to the actual murder. Like, did they, like, I don't know, like, listen to whatever could then check? No, 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 this, this shit is real. Like, it was a small caliber bullet that killed him. Um, it's the uh, homeless guy was actually in a wheelchair the projectile like the angle of it didn't match up enough to like make a case but was it like the same bullet for the gun honestly i can't remember i don't know if they found him with a gun or it was just it could have been a knife with a blade that was like long enough to be considered a weapon i used to be like super obsessed with like looking into it and doing you know, looking up his criminal record while also not wanting to, like, convict or judge the black man in a wheelchair behind our house because he was homeless. But just, I don't know, you try to piece together something so bizarre as that, and that was, like, the only narrative that, that made sense to me. So, your brother is done then. How does that change the dynamic after I'm um, you know, guys? Like, for, for you, like, OD, you mentioned you're, like, obsessively looking into, like, these friends and things. Anything else? Like, it's traumatic, and think about trauma is, like, all sorts of, like, mm, it's like, triggering, but shit. I was. Someone's, like, being high or drunk for, like, three to six months to a year afterwards. Like, that time is just a blur. Did you, yeah. did you acknowledge it? Cause, like, I tried to, like, you know, you kind of know that you're going through something big and you check out different support groups and then you just fucking bizarre. You realize, like, everybody's getting murdered. <laughs> like, you go to a support group and there's, like, 20 people sitting around in a circle and everyone's, like know somebody that's been murdered and you're like this is fucking crazy like how is this happening um i think that's like something for like presidents for what i'm trying to say though is i feel like everyone thinks this shit is like oh it's just me right like it's just fucking me but it's like no matter what your story is i feel like almost always there's someone to go really to you you know it's like there's someone else that's fucking experienced that fucking thing. Like, maybe not the exact same story, but like... No, like, similar. Yeah. I'm gonna be like, you went into cancer before we experienced that. Like, it was so... Mm, heartfelt and meaningful, like, when he was going through cancer to see, like, how many groups and people had been, like, touched by that and cared about it. Um... Sounds like in a weird way it gave you almost like a sense of community. Yeah. No, no, the cancer definitely gave a sense of community. The murder was like very isolating. Even when looking up supporters, like, not to knock what like my dad was going through. Um, but there's a lot for like parents of murdered children, children dealing with like murdered parents. There's not like a it's really nothing for siblings, and it's a different kind of loss. So, like, finding that community or something was, like, non-existent. So what groups are you going to just... Parents with murder children was, like, pretty good, and it's, like, open. So you had, like, aunts and uncles, friends, girlfriends. Like, it, it is just open. It's by name only, but... I don't know, at least I experienced, like, wanting, like, as close of a connection as possible. More so than when it was, like, cancer. Like, I wanted, like, a brother who had dealt with a brother dying. And it was insane. Like, it was embarrassing. Like, I was reaching out on the internet to, like, stories of, like, people that had gone through it to, like, just talk to somebody that had experienced that. 
mm. like not really any of it but but yeah just uh kind of have that same feeling that you did with cancer so oh yeah like i don't know, just want to like talk about it all the time or at least i did some people don't yeah. at all yeah, well, I'm sure it's like hard to because I'm sure at this point your brother probably feels like your best friend, right? You're fucking living with him, you're talking to him every day, right? And then he gets taken away from him and it's like, who, who do I like? Who can I understand this to the degree of what I'm even to understand it to that I can talk to? Yeah, yeah, it's 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 wild, and it's and it's not like it's just like very close lip, which is funny because like we live in like a very violent society, but. You realize that like murder happens all the time. Most of them go unresolved. Huh? That's it. People just, yeah, people just kind of deal with it. And you do think like, it didn't upset me, but I was flabbergasted by it. Most of the questions were just like, oh, well, what was he into? Like, um, was he into drugs? Like, did you guys have like gang affiliations? Like. <laughs> I mean, it was just insane. Like everyone tried to wrap their mind around like, oh, well, this, this doesn't happen to us. So like, how do we compartmentalize? Like my coworkers, I was a teacher at the time. So, you know, whenever I was just like another white teacher and other white teachers were just like, oh, I, I don't like how close this is. Like, how do we make sense of, of this thing? So I don't know. Maybe it makes you feel safer. You know, One of the other things that's like so uncommon, it's like he has to be doing something shady, right? Like, right. To get, well, I mean, uncommon to, because I feel. Uh, no, it's like, like a news thing. Like, yeah, uncommon is like the wrong word. You know, I do feel like part of it's like, okay, it gets swept under the rug when it does happen to normal people. And like society portrays it, like media and stuff portrays it. Like, if you're shot, it's because you were doing something you weren't supposed to be doing. No, you do. And. I re realized how I like judged other local news stories when, I don't know, like my family was on the news and that was weird. And how many times I like maybe dismissed families because somebody came out in their like slippers and a big baggy t-shirt. <laughs> I was just like, oh, well, that's, that's that kind of family. And then it was like my family being caught off guard by news cameras and you like want to go out and like get the news because you're you want to get your story out on the news because a lot of cases are solved by somebody seeing that and saying something. And, you know, it was like my dad and his like lawn work shirt saying some nonsense on the news that didn't really make sense. But he was like trying his best to answer questions. It's like, huh. Yeah, nobody can help but look like those weirdos that have dealt with this like terrible trauma. Can someone please help us, you know? Yeah, I mean, that's really what it is. And then it's funny, you know, like people start calling in and like contacting you about psychics and tarot cards and weird dreams. Yeah, yeah, it's really cool. <laughs> Is there a way that you like to remember him as like a person and then like kind of like his honor type of thing? Or... Uh, yeah, like every year I go back to where he was killed. We sit and I have Telemore do, which is what we were drinking the night he was killed. The night he was killed, we were walking to the bar complaining about Arizona gun laws. It's just wild to me. Run. Yeah. It's so crazy. Just how fucking easy it is to get guns in this country. Um, so I go there every year, have a picture of him in my kitchen. It's we cooked all the time. I don't know, it's hard. Like, still, it's insane. It's been almost seven years seven years when I go back to the site in May and we I don't know like I still want to send them like dick and fart jokes via text like it's, it doesn't go away we're about to have a kid and like on my lunch break I want to like sit and talk to him about how crazy it is and what I'm in for and yeah, if you he can help me babysit. 
Shit like that. Yeah. It's... And the most, like, fucked up thing about m- murdering somebody is... It just, like, continues. Like, the... Maybe the, like, PTSD wears off eventually, which sucks in its own way. So PTSD is almost nice. But... Yeah, it just... It doesn't stop, so it's just, like, a... Lasting violation. Yeah, I'm sure because there's, like... No closure, too. No, no, no closure at all. But I also wonder if, like, they had caught the person and we'd, like, been in the courtroom and they'd, like, convicted them, if that would have really helped. I don't fucking know. I think, I think it probably would have, just because you at least have, like, a missing piece of the puzzle, like, more information, right? Because now your mind's always gonna wonder, like, what the fuck really happened and why, why do we not have these answers, right? Yeah, it, it's like such a short narrative of knowing. So I told you that, like, there's a belligerent guy at the bar before he left. He helped his coworker, even though he wasn't working, like, close up the bar. Um, and then he walked home, and it was three blocks. And something in that quick narrative of like closing, closing the bar and walking home, like something crazy, something astronomical happened. And it's just such like an important gap in the story that you do always wonder about. It gets less and less, I guess, or less and less important. Like the absence is always there. But. I want to thank you for listening to this podcast. If you are interested in being on the podcast, please email cartherapypod at gmail.com. Thank you.